Oh, hey. Didn't see you there. Now, let's talk about cross-site scripting. Now, if you clicked on this video, you probably don't know what cross-site scripting is, or you don't have a great idea of what it is and you want to learn a little bit more. Either way, I got you covered here. First, we're going to talk a little bit about what cross-site scripting is, and then we're going to talk about the different types of cross-site scripting, and then we're going to go through an example of each of them to helpfully solidify your knowledge in what an actual cross-site scripting attack vector looks like, how to identify it, and why it's been so big in the OWASP top 10 over the past couple years. So if you don't know what cross-site scripting is, we should start at square one. What is cross-site scripting? So a real high level definition of cross-site scripting would be when user input is taken and sent to a backend server. And then that user input is treated as safe by the developers. So then that user input is written back into the response that you would then see consequently. And that causes JavaScript to execute in the client's browser. Ultimately, the common theme of cross-site scripting is that it's going to cause arbitrary JavaScript to execute in the browser. Now that we have a pretty basic understanding of what cross-site scripting is, let's take a quick look at the three different kinds of cross-site scripting before we jump into examples of them. You can check out all three types of them listed right here. However, we're going to dig deep into each one of them and talk about them a little bit more specific. Now, the first one that you'll check out right here is reflected cross-site scripting. And reflected cross-site scripting is probably the most trivial and the easiest to identify. Reflected cross-site scripting actually is going to execute every single time the user interacts with the payload itself. And now that might make more sense here in a couple seconds when I show you an example of it, but essentially every time that this payload is passed to the server, the server processes it and then sends it back in the source code, then causing JavaScript to execute. And that's kind of the key differentiator of reflected cross-site scripting. Now, the second on the list here is persistent cross-site scripting. And you'll even hear some people call this stored cross-site scripting. And how this differs from reflected cross-site scripting is instead of the user needing to store the payload and send it and have a user interact with it every single time to get the JavaScript to execute, the application's database or application's memory is actually storing the cross-site scripting payload itself. That means that we only need to send the payload one time. The application's gonna store it for us and then every time that page is loaded, that JavaScript will continually executing every single time it's loaded into the page. As you may be thinking, this one is a little bit more severe than the previous one. <laughs> and then the last here on the list is DOM-based cross-site scripting. And now this one's a little bit more complicated. However, DOM-based cross-site scripting is all associated with the document object model of the page itself. And if you don't know what the document object model is, one, I'm going to link a quick little article in the description below. But at a very high level, you can just think about it as the HTML source code of the actual web page. Now, in dot based cross-site scripting is going to be differentiated from reflected cross-site scripting in one little teeny tiny key differentiator, where reflected cross-site scripting, the server side code or the actual source code of the page is what was being manipulated to trigger JavaScript. DOM-based cross-site scripting, like how we talked about it's the actual hierarchy of the HTML code that's being returned to you, it's causing JavaScript to execute in the client-side code instead of the server-side code. And that's the key thing to differentiate there between the two because they are very, very closely intertwined. And now that we have at least a pretty general understanding of what each of those three types of cross-site scripting are, we're going to go over to a website called Juice Shop, which is actually developed by OWASP themselves to demonstrate each one of these vulnerabilities. And I'm going to give you guys a quick demonstration of what these look like and how it ties into those definitions that we just talked about. Let's head right over to that website. 
Okay, so now that we have both the website pulled up and the text editor pulled up, we can go ahead and take a look at an example of the first type of cross-site scripting, which is just gonna be reflected cross-site scripting. Now, if we turn our attention over to the text editor over here, you can see I went ahead and just dropped a little cross-site scripting payload in here. And essentially all that you need to know about this is that this is specifying an opening and closing script tag in HTML. And basically what the script tag allows you to do is write valid JavaScript code and have it evaluated by the browser. And then this alert item that's being called right here is actually a function and it creates a pop-up when evaluated. And then the one is just going to be what's written in the pop-up itself. So basically what this is going to do is that if this is written back in a response to us, it's going to specify script tags so that we can write JavaScript. And then we're going to use the JavaScript function alert to create a pop-up with the number one on it to prove that we're having JavaScript execute in the browser. And now if we turn our attention back over to the web browser here, we can see that there is a search field. And what we want to do when looking for cross-site scripting is try to find a point where user input or our input is then written back to the page. So we see a search bar here and we can just go ahead and start entering things to see what we get. If we enter test, we see that test is written back in the response right here. What we can try to do now is send in our cross-site scripting payload. And if this is written back to the page, it should be written back as valid HTML and then the JavaScript inside will evaluate. If we go ahead and copy that payload and then paste it into the search bar and hit enter, that alert should be evaluated and JavaScript should execute and we should see a pop-up. So if we hit search, we do. So there we go. We see that JavaScript was executed in the browser and that little pop-up is proof. So that, in a nutshell, is a very basic example of reflected cross-site scripting. And now we're back to demonstrate stored cross-site scripting. And if you remember, this is the one that's going to stay on the page and be executed every single time. Now, if you saw with that reflected cross-site scripting, we would have to enter that into the search bar every single time. If you browse back to the home page, that cross-site scripting payload is not going to be on the home page every time you visit it. Whereas with this stored cross-site scripting payload, we can have that stored by the application's database. Now, if we come down here and look at something like a blog post, for example, we can think of something that is going to be loaded into the application every time that the page is loaded. And if you look down here, there's the option to leave a comment. And you can see that old comments are actually loaded onto the page every single time that this comment page is pulled up. If we go ahead and we take our cross-site scripting payload and drop it in the comment field and then use the name hacker and the email address hacker at hacker.net and we'll leave them the website httphacker.com and then post this comment we should get that same pop-up every single time that the page is loaded. We actually didn't navigate back to the page, so the JavaScript didn't execute, but if we go back to the blog, we should see the JavaScript execute, and there it is. And just to prove to you guys that this is going to be staying in memory and stored, you can go ahead and click the refresh button, and it should execute again, which on the previous type of cross-site scripting would not have been the case. So if we go ahead and we click the refresh button here, boom, we have that JavaScript execute once again. So that is an example of stored cross-site scripting. Okay, and now we're back here in a different lab to demonstrate the third type of cross-site scripting, which is DOM-based cross-site scripting. Now, if you remember the key differentiator between DOM-based and reflected is that DOM is going to cause the JavaScript execution in client-side code. So that is going to be a very stark difference in websites that dynamically update this single page. Now, if you'll recall on the reflected cross-site scripting example, we had our input and then it returned us a completely different page with our input return in the response. Now with this dynamic page, our input is just going to be evaluated by client side code. And then this page itself is actually going to be updated. And that's what we mean by in the client side code. If we go into the same search field, we're going to enter a slightly different payload this time. 
This time, if you turn your attention over to the text editor, we're on the second line here, we're actually specifying an HTML image tag. And when we load it in, we're loading it in with this source attribute. That's where you would typically specify what file to load in as an image, but we're just gonna feed it this one as a kind of a garbage value. So it intentionally causes an error. And then we have this error or event handler, and it's actually going to handle the event that the image doesn't load correctly. When this image doesn't load correctly because it has a garbage source, we're going to run the JavaScript function that we did last time, which is that alert. So this is another neat little trick of a payload that we can do. So what we'll do is we'll take that and we'll come back over to the search field. And since the search field is dynamically updating, we can enter that field for test We'll go back and we can enter that cross-site scripting payload. And then if we go ahead and we hit search, we should see that our image that we entered fails to load in the background here. And then as a result, our JavaScript executes and then we get this pop-up. So that was an example of DOM-based cross-site scripting. And with all of that, that is actually it for today's video. I hope you guys learned a thing or two about cross-site scripting. And if you did, please feel free, like, comment, or subscribe, or share the channel. It really helps with any growth that we can have here. Um, and it helps me continue to produce more content and pump things out like this for you guys. I'm going to be continuing this series along with other Hack the Box walkthroughs for now. and. And also, if you guys are interested in checking out any type of training or certification courses, I actually partnered up with Zero Point Security. You can check out some of their courses that do, in fact, help out the channel in the description below. I'll have the affiliate link to all three of the courses that they offer and their certification programs below. With that out of the way, thank you guys for taking the time to watch, and I will catch you in the next one.